I joined the Navy uh, three days after my 19th birthday. In my case, that would have been February 5th, uh, 1968. Uh, went to basic training at the Great Lakes Naval Training Center, where I think the high temperature in the time I was there was somewhere between five and 10 below zero, and I went from there to Vietnam. <laughs> kind of a slight adjustment. Actually, after I, after I left boot camp, I was um, in dry dock, the ship, the Krishna was the ship I was on, and we were in dry dock in Yokosuka, Japan for a few months, uh, retrofitting the, the ship and so forth and getting it ready to take care of swift boat repair and maintenance, which we did. Uh, we got underway from, from uh, Yokosuka and dropped anchor in Antoy, and I was, I was in Antoy um, approximately nine months. So my day-to-day -day operations, I was not a swift boat crew member, I was not on a swift boat. Uh, my job was to repair and maintain them when they come ba came back from patrol. So during the course of the day, I would be on two or three. So there's no one that I worked on. Some of them they would come back had very obviously they'd been in firefights and so forth. And so you could tell when they came back from patrol, uh, they they'd been in some pretty serious combat. The longest nonstop run I had of working on a swift boat, I started at 11 a.m and finished at 1 p.m. That would be 1 p.m. the next day. That would be 26 hours later, not two. Uh, but when they came back, it was all hands on deck. If the ship had been through some pretty serious combat and so forth, and, and you needed to get it back up and running, uh, it, was, it was time to hit the deck and, and hit it running. And I had, uh, had some interesting experiences. One of the swift boats came back, and as you can imagine, in a combat zone, supplies were sketchy at best and uh, looked at some of the battery banks and uh, some of the battery posts had been in, in some pretty serious shape. You put them under enough stress and so forth. And I looked at one of these and I did the electrolyte reading to make sure that the electrolyte inside the, the battery was still fine. And it was, but the post needed help. And we didn't have a large rack of batteries that we could draw from. And I looked at the deck and there were a lot of 50 caliber machine guns on the deck. And I looked at, looked at one of those and I thought, that, that looks like the same size as a battery post. And it was. So I, I hacksawed off the firing pin end of it, and I took, just like my barber, I took a little off the top. And then I put it on a grinding wheel, and I very, th one side of it was very, very thin. So then I tapped that over what was left of the battering post, got some solder, poured it in there, let it cool, took a hammer and chisel, and then peeled that away, and had a brand new battery post. And my commanding officer, I still remember this, so he saw that and he laughed, and he said, well, that's, that's one way to do it. So necessity really is the mother of invention, so we had to get pretty creative. And I've spoken with a lot of the, the crew members that were on swift boats, and this won't surprise you at all, the camaraderie was airtight. These guys were, they were up against it, and they, they had each other's backs. Well, even though we were not on the tip of the spear, the camaraderie of those, among those of us that worked on them and repaired them and maintained them, we got along well. We were, we were a tight bunch, so when they came in and they needed, needed anything, we were on it, and we were on it now, and we took a lot of pride in that. We really did. We were uh, we were a, a, an organized group, and in retrospect, and I'm sure that I remember this with clarity. I don't remember any arguments or disagreements, no yelling. That's pretty amazing under the circumstances that we were operating under. We were we were uh, brothers in arms, and we knew it. So when they came in, and it was time to get them up and running. We did it, and I, I can't tell you how many guys, even when they would come back from patrol map and say, hey, you know, I need a new voltage regulator, I need win new windshield wipers or whatever, we, we took pride in keeping them up and running. They were incredibly reliable craft. Some, some photos, Matt, where there's, and I, I didn't take the measurements quite frankly, but if I would estimate, then uh, the hull was a quarter of inch thick of, of aluminum, so there were some pretty serious holes in this thing, and we, we cut that out with, with uh, whole side with saws and so forth obviously and before we would put new plates in you could see this exposed area and I would say it's about three feet long maybe two two and a half feet wide there was there was a hole that size in it now it was up near the deck which I'm sure helped if it was you know down below the waterline and I, I don't know quite frankly what their fate would have been but uh, that was my most vivid memory of one that came back with some pretty huge huge holes and that was in the um, starboard side of that as I recall and when windshields being shattered and so forth that was extremely common when I had when it was my turn for duty I always had the same watch station I was on the bow and I had a, an ammunition box full of concussion grenades and I had an M16 and the purpose for that was to keep any of the Viet Cong 
from swimming up to our ship and planting explosives. Now, when I th threw concussion grenades over the side, it wasn't every five minutes or every 10 minutes, very obvious, for obvious reasons, it was staggered. I'd throw one, and then maybe two or three minutes later, literally, I'd throw another one, and then maybe a half an hour. I didn't want, I didn't want uh, the enemy maintaining any sort of a schedule and so forth. And there were a couple of nights where I would yell out to the, to the sampan fishing boats that were nearby. I'd, I'd yell for them in English, go away, and, and more often than not, that would work. If it didn't, I would squeeze off a few rounds in front of the bow. I didn't, you know, these, most of them were legitimate fishermen. Uh, they didn't want to injure anybody, really didn't. But sure, it was, a, it was a war zone. There was a war going on, and where I was at Antoy was, I believe, the largest POW station in Vietnam. So very obviously, the Viet Cong would have loved to have had a, you know, a massive jailbreak kind of thing. So yeah, that, that concern was there. But as I say, for my day-to-day -day operations, I didn't have it you know, to the same level of, of combat and, and potential hazard that the swift boat crew members had. Those of us that repaired them didn't face that daily. Although the Krishna did get underway two times at least that I can recall, possibly three, we would, we would physically get up and gun, get underway and leave Anthoid and we would shell, because there were 40 millimeters forward and aft and 52, 50 calibers both port and starboard. And we went up to kind of disrupt uh, where the bad guys were getting settled in and so forth. But we didn't do that a lot. That happened two or three times with me, as I say. And we took, you know, there was fire that, that came in and so forth. But over nine months, that's not, that's not commensurate with what uh, the Swift Boat crew members had to endure. There was a, a number of islands near Antoy, and we would go over there. We would have steaks and beer and that kind of thing, as you would, you know, on your off day and so forth. And at the time, and this thing, probably it was about the size of that book right there. It looked like a shoebox by comparison to today's cameras. But I had a Polaroid. I mean, this was 1968 or 69, I don't remember which, which year this took place. But I had a Polaroid camera and I saw a group of, of local people that looked like a, a husband and wife and, and some of their children and so forth. And they seemed tentative when they saw me and I had some chocolate. Uh, so I, I held that forward and then they just, you know, obviously that went over well. And, and I did that, I had the camera and I tried to, you know, in sign language, if you will, mention them that I wanted to take a photo. And, and they got the hang of that and they went for it. So I took a Polaroid picture of them and this was back in the 60s, obviously. It took, I think, a minute for the photo to develop. And if I live to be a thousand, I'm not gonna forget their reaction. So every time we went over to that part of the island, I made sure I had plenty of Polaroid film and lots of chocolate. So my interaction with the locals was, was just fine. And then over in, in uh, Anthoi, which is the village, I could see it from, from the bow of the ship, uh, we went over there and we had a small, it was a hooch or a hutch, I guess you would call it, a corrugated building type deal. And we had a pool table in there and some fans and we'd go over there and have beer and that kind of stuff. And there were the locals that worked in there also. And it was fine, you know, we would just tell them, hey, you know, two beers or whatever. And, so my interaction with the Vietnamese was always extremely positive. There was, there was in my case, there wasn't anything ever, any, at all negative that right. took place.